Welcome to the future and episode number six of Seeking Delphi. Technology, the good, the bad, and the existential. I'm Mark Sackler. We've all heard or used the line, technology is great when it works. But is that always true? Technology that works often does bad things. There are side effects and unintended consequences. Cars work but they cause air and noise pollution. Smartphones work, but cause social disruption. And don't even talk to me about distracted driving. These things, however, are mere annoyances compared to the very real existential threats that some technologies have the potential to engender. They may threaten the very nature or even existence of humanity. Almost on cue for the airing of this program, physicist Stephen Hawking has issued a warning. He stated that establishment of a global government is the only way to control technologies that might otherwise destroy us. I don't know if he's right, but I do know of someone who has made a comprehensive study of the various existential threats from technology. Ollie Hagstrom is a professor of mathematics at Chalmers University of Technology in Göteborg, Sweden. I recently put in a call to Ali in Sweden to discuss these issues. I'm speaking with Ali Hagstrom. He is the author of Here Be Dragons, Science, Technology, and the Future of Humanity. Ali, you're a professor of mathematics, so what brought you to write a book on the existential risks of technology? What is the purpose? What motivated you? Uh, while there are, thank you, by the way, for inviting me to this interview. Uh, there are a few uh, clear connections between uh, mathematics uh, and the topics I treat in this book. For instance, uh, risk analysis. Uh, risk theory is an important part of uh, mathematical statistics. And uh, this uh, features to some extent uh, in the book. But I would say... But for me personally, the motivation for the book has not really uh, come from uh, my professional work as a mathematician, but more uh, from my general uh, engagement as a concerned world citizen. So these are issues, uh, the issues that I treat in the book are issues that I find extremely important uh, and uh, I decided I'd, I want to tackle them. And if my mathematical skills come in handy in some places, then that's good. Uh, but it's not really the purpose. Uh, the purpose is to treat the issues, and, and that is what uh, has governed the, uh, let's say, the outline of the book, rather than any attempt to fit this into a particular subject area. So would you see your overall view then as a concerned citizen, um, not necessarily anti-technology, but concerned about how technology is used? Yes. Uh, no, I, I, I would never call myself anti-technology. Uh, but I think that there's much to be gained uh, from understanding that uh, consequences of uh, technology aren't always automatically going to be for the better and that uh, we can uh, try to act with foresight, uh, push those technologies uh, that uh, look uh, benign in a more clear-cut way and advance with somewhat more caution uh, in fields that uh, look dangerous. And currently, I'm not seeing much of that. So I, th I hope uh, by pointing at some of the risks, I can contribute to tilting the debate uh, towards more awareness of risk and uh, um, more ambition to act with foresight. Okay, let's talk about a couple of the um, different 
technologies and, and existential risks you've discussed. The first one, one that's quite germane, very much to the present day, because we see the effects starting now, and that's global climate change. Now, you did apply some math there in terms of discussing the feedback that's already in the system. One would think that that feedback that's in the system kind of limits what we can and can't do, at least in the, the short run. How would you uh, assess that and um, also talk about the potential solutions you discussed in the book? So I would call my chapter on climate change probably uh, the most mainstream uh, chapter of the book. Uh, I don't have any uh, particularly... Um, novel things uh, to add on the on the climate science part of the issue. And I also subscribe to the mainstream view that uh, the main thing to do is try to limit our impact uh, on climate by cutting down on our greenhouse gas emissions. Now, uh, things uh, uh, aren't looking uh, very good in terms of ability to coordinate action on this issue uh, and we aren't cutting back uh, as fast as we ought to and things are looking even worse after the latest American presidential election I would say. So there are some more extreme uh, ways to handle climate uh, that go under the general heading of geoengineering which may come up as sort of uh, a plan B or a plan C if uh, the uh, greenhouse gas emission cuts uh, do not materialize and uh, at some point maybe uh, 20, 30, 40 years from now we seem to be heading to some really disastrous scenarios. Then there we might end up being in a position that uh, let's say the only way to prevent the catastrophic meltdown of, of the Greenland ice sheet or the West Antarctic ice sheet would be to pour particles uh, into the stratosphere with the purpose of blocking out, out parts of the incoming sunlight and thereby compensating for uh, the uh, added greenhouse effect from our greenhouse gas emissions. But all those plans look very, very dangerous and I would very much like us, humanity, uh, to work on climate change in such a way that we are not pushed into a corner uh, where we will feel that uh, this is the way to go, the geoengineering stuff. Isn't there already a certain amount of um, change because of the, the feedback loops that you talk about? Isn't there a certain amount that's already in the systems? I mean, if we could cut back substantially on the gases now, there's, we're still going to suffer a certain amount of, of yes. continued warming. This is true. This is true. So the climate system has uh, uh, a fair amount of inertia, uh, and we haven't yet seen all the warming that we've sort of committed to through, through the uh, uh, emissions that we've done so far. This is true. Okay, let's talk about two um, uh, types of technology or, or existential risk from technology that look very, very difficult to quantify that you are uh, express deep concern about in your book. But I think in both of these, the uh, genie's already out of the box in some respect. Um, and those are artificial intelligence, uh, uh, the potential of artificial intelligence running amok. Yeah. And then the but potential for being overrun by hostile aliens by our attempts to, to contact extraterrestrial intelligence. I mean, artificial intelligence is being developed all over the place. It's not an easy thing to control mm -hmm. uh, who develops what. And, of course, in terms of the aliens, the uh, we've been broadcasting our presence through our electromagnetic radiation uh, for at least 100 uh, years. So w what do you think is going to happen with this? How do you uh, suggest we approach these? issues? Uh, so I think we better discuss them one at a time. Okay, uh, start with the artificial intelligence. Yes. Uh, so uh, this is going to be relatively speculative, but I think that uh, what's reasonable to expect 
is that uh, biological evolution uh, uh, has not, through the creation of the human brain, uh, found uh, anything like a global optimum in terms of uh, producing intelligence. Uh, and uh, if we accept this, and if we accept, as I do, intelligence as a physical, non-mysterious phenomenon, then there are ways to set up matter so as to uh, attain intelligence on very much superhuman levels. Uh, what we can call superintelligence. Uh, and uh, I believe that in the long run, if uh, our uh, technological civilization continues unhampered, we should expect to be able to create such stuff. But it's uh, very, very much more difficult to uh, pin down any particular timeline for this. Uh, but uh, I, I, I think there's a substantial, substantial chance that this might happen uh, in the coming century or so. And uh, so a rhetorical question one might ask here is, can we then expect to remain in control? And it seems quite naive to think that we will. So the conclusion from that is that our fate, when we're no longer the most intelligent creatures on the planet, uh, our fate will be in the hands of these machines, and the, everything will then matter, depend on what they're programmed to do, uh, what are their goals and their motivations. And if they are not in line with human values, with promoting human welfare and so on, we're in trouble. So what we better do is try and figure out ways to we have to work out this uh, in advance, because once the superintelligence is in place, it won't uh, let us tamper with it. So I discussed this problem in the book. A lot of it is based on, on the work of philosopher Nick Bostrom uh, and on um, artificial intelligence uh, uh, wizard Elsie Yudkowsky. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, we have to be like very, uh, very humble about uh, predicting what's going to happen, but at the same time, it's a very good idea to start preparing and uh, thinking about what are the kinds of scenarios that we want to avoid. Okay, let's move on to hostile aliens, which yes. is a, a different kind of superior intelligence. And you seem to be very concerned about our advertising our presence to the universe. Uh, yes. Um, you know, it's a very uh, open problem uh, whether or not uh, there are uh, advanced civilizations uh, out there. And if you ask me for my best guess, I would say that uh, probably there aren't, but there could be. Uh, and in case there are uh, highly technological civilizations, which, which we could expect to be very, very much more advanced than us, because they're probably not exactly the same age as us, probably millions or billions of years older, and have had much more time to develop. So uh, probably they would have the capacity for uh, interstellar travel uh, and so on, perhaps military technologies that go far, far beyond anything we have even thought about. And the question then is, will they be, their view towards us, would it be benign or would they maybe want to wipe us out? And we don't know, and therefore we should be careful. I don't think, I don't believe in scenarios where they would invade us uh, because uh, they want to eat us, attack us uh, for our protein. Uh, that seems very far-fetched. Uh, if, if they would want to do that, they would have probably done it a long, long time ago. It would take a huge coincidence for them to decide to do that at the exact moment uh, when we're about to take our own great technological leap, which I think we're in the process of doing. Rather, I think that if we're attacked, it will be because uh, they decide that we're a threat and they 
decide to uh, wipe us out for preemptive uh, reasons. But this is all extremely speculative, and I put uh, less emphasis on this in my book, just a couple of short sections compared to the artificial intelligence threat, partly because I believe that if this really is a problem, then probably there isn't much we can do about it. So it doesn't pay off as much to worry about this problem compared to, uh, for instance, the uh, threat from uh, artificial intelligence. Okay, one um, final area I'd like to touch on, and we could go on for ages on all the issues in your book, but that's the doomsday scenario, something that you talked about, and it's very mathematical, maybe the most mathematical portion yes. of the book, and it's something that you rejected. So tell us about that and, and what your alternative view is. The doomsday argument is an argument that has haunted the Futurology Society for, for a, a couple of decades. And the main idea is this. If you look at the entire past, present, and future history of humanity, imagine some point in the far, far future where, where one can summarize this entire history. And look at all the humans that have been alive, then only a small portion, uh, small fraction uh, of this population will live, uh, will be among the very earliest humans. Now, you and I, we both have birth rank of approximately 60 billion. Uh, if you count the first human ever, ever as number one, the second human ever as number two, and so on, and at about 60 uh, billion we arrive at present time. This, of course, depends on on the exact definition of what is a human, but the arguments are somewhat robust to these variations. Uh, anyway, so the idea is that in case humanity uh, survives the next few hundred years and go, goes on to create a highly stable and flourishing uh, civilization that goes on to maybe call my space and live on for millions of years, then we uh, will be among the extreme early ones. And the doomsday's argument says that that's unlikely, so we'll probably go extinct before such uh, benign events uh, take place. Now, I think the argument is mistaken. I think that it's, at heart, it's a statistical argument. In statistics, we have two different directions that one should be careful about uh, mixing with each other because there are potential confusion. There's frequentist statistics and there is Bayesian statistics. And the doomsday argument, as I phrased it here, is it's based on a mix-up of those uh, two lines of reasoning. So what I do in the book is I explain this and then I try and work out is there a way to resurrect the argument uh, along the lines of frequentist statistics? The answer turns out to be no. Is there a way to uh, resurrect it uh, using Bayesian statistics? The answer turns out to be uh, a little more unclear, but at best for uh, advocates of the doomsday argument, the best conclusion I can get for them is that it remains unclear whether this argument has uh, bearing or not uh, on our civilization. For me personally, I think that because of the abstractness of the doomsday argument, it doesn't tell us anything about how we should act in order to improve our chances of long-term survival. So I think it's better just to... to put that aside and to focus on more concrete risks, uh, such as uh, nuclear holocaust or, or um, risks coming from artificial intelligence and other technologies. Because uh, with those more concrete risks, it's easier to come up with concrete ways to go, actions that improve our chances. And the doomsday argument doesn't offer any of that. One last thing here, going back to the hostile 
aliens it kind of plays out of that and that's your discussion of the great filter kind of something that grows out of the drake equation to take it one step farther tell us what you did with that and why so the great filter uh, is a wonderful theoretical framework due to economist robin hansen and uh, a paper he wrote in the late 1990s which takes at as its starting point the fact that there seem to be many billions, billions of billions, uh, and probably more than that, planets that are potentially inhabitable or can give rise to life. And uh, it seems that none of them so far has given rise to an intergalactic civilization of the kind that would be visible to astronomers uh, all over the visible universe, and because we can't see them. Uh, if they were visible to astronomers all over the universe, we would probably see them somehow. Their mega structures, their Dyson spheres, and so on. Uh, so probably they don't exist, and if they don't exist, that means that Somewhere on the evolution uh, from the early stages of a planet uh, to the stage of this kind of super civilization, there is in one or more places some bottleneck that filters out most of the planets. Perhaps the emergence of life is very unlikely, perhaps uh, at some uh, later stages in the development of life, life there, there are severe bottlenecks, or perhaps there is something uh, at the level of the technological civilization on our level or beyond, which uh, wipes out most potential candidates for these kinds of super civilization. Perhaps simply most uh, civilizations who reach the level of being able to produce atomic bombs and artificial intelligence or whatever, uh, wipe themselves out. Now, the question of whether this bottleneck is before or after our stage of human civilization is kind of relevant to our chances, because if it's behind us, good, then we've done the most difficult part. But it's if, if it's ahead of us, then this is probably not a good sign for our chances to expand and populate the universe. This is also related to what I said about extraterrestrials. The fact that we're not seeing them is contributes to my uh, conjecture that they are probably not out there at all. But this is a field which is so full of uncertainties that uh, one really should be humble about saying anything for certain. Ollie. In any case, yeah. I, I do think that this great filter formalism is a much better theoretical way uh, to think about these questions compared to the doomsday argument. Ali, thank you so much for your time and congratulations on what I consider to be a, an excellent discussion of the wide range of existential risks, both probable and improbable. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. It was uh, good to talk to you. I highly recommend Here Be Dragons. It's a must for any serious futurist, or for that matter, anyone serious about the future of humanity. In this week's news, commercial space ventures continue to make headlines. Bigelow Aerospace announced plans to launch a lunar orbiting space station in 2020, and Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin, also targeting 2020, plans to launch a robotic moon lander as a first step to establishing a manned base, and along with it, an Amazon-like delivery service to supply that base. Scientists at the Department of Energy's Lawrence Berkeley Lab, working in partnership with the California Institute of Technology, have announced that in just the past two years, they have made discoveries that have doubled the number of materials that can be used to generate solar fuels. And finally, Volkswagen announced the newest entry into driverless vehicle development. They call it Cedric and say it will be summonable at the push of a button or from your smartphone.
I can just imagine the arguments between Cedric and Siri. Links to relevant stories mentioned today are available on the Seeking Delphi blog page for this episode. And you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or YouTube. Your comments, questions, and requests for future content are always welcome. You can submit them at www.seekingdelphi.com or on our Facebook page. Thanks for joining me. My technical advisor is Mohamed Marouf. Until next time, I'm Mark Sackler.